reflecting with Christ. We thank you for your words of life that you share with us daily, that you give us a mind that can understand through your spirit what we need to know to live godly lives. We thank you for the opportunities that we have daily to get to know you better, get to know other people better, appreciate other people more than we ever have before, recognize that we're all different, we're all special. We thank you for this day and this evening. And I know that uh, Vivian's going to bring me a piece of cake. She's a very kind hearted lady. We thank you, Father, that you bring us together. And in, in studying your word, we draw closer together. And we thank you for the leadership locally we have through Kirk. And it's in God's holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, I had forgotten to start it before we prayed, uh, so I started it during the prayer, and so this is week 15, our last week in Revelation, here on Monday nights at the Reunion and online as well, and so we will be wrapping it up tonight. Uh, it's been a blessing to study with all of you, and even though some of you uh, of course, I'm not seeing in person that are online. I've noted your presence every week and uh, still have been blessed by you being there and have heard from a number of you uh, in various ways anyway. And so I'm just thankful for this uh, uh, media that we can use to be able to study together uh, over a distance. So let's go ahead and and go on into uh, our material. Uh, I have here this, uh, it's an excerpt like two others that I have shared with you in the past uh, from Brian Zahn's book, Centers in the Hands of a Loving God, The Scandalous Truth of the Very Good News. And uh, Brian just does a good job. And, uh, not only dealing with the subject as a whole, and it's really the image and the thought behind Jesus's parable. It's not just Brian Zahn's take or perspective. Uh, take Jesus in uh, Luke 15 and the three parables, the lost sheep, lost coin. And we have to say the lost sons, plural, the two prodigal sons, both the younger and the older but the way that the Father uh, lovingly welcomes and includes both of them, whether the younger son uh, in his hedonistic lifestyle, living for pleasures, or the older son in his pharisaical lifestyle, his self-righteous lifestyle, the Father loves just the same. And we'll look at a few excerpts here in 21 and 22 tonight. Uh, we did chapter seven, uh, chapter seven and eight. Uh, chapter nine is about the city of the Lamb, the new Jerusalem. So just a few reflections that we will take from that. Uh, let, me, let me say to begin with, let me go ahead uh, to this resource here a different book that I've not read from yet, but still just a little more insight about apocalyptic literature, what revelation is. So it's apocalyptic is, is unveiling, it is pulling back. And so just a few highlights here. The, the point of apocalyptic literature is not prediction, but it's unmasking, unveiling the realities around us for what they really are. While the Roman empire pretends to be a gift to civilization and the zenith, the epitome of human accomplishment, 
John's apocalyptic perspective from a heavenly, ang heavenly angle shows us the reality. Rome is a monster. Apocalyptic literature is like that. The rival empires that would captivate us have something to hide. So you could say they tilt the louvers, the window louvers just slightly to cover what they want to hide. They paint a beautiful picture on the screen, one that captivates and mesmerizes and inspires. If we look at the screen straight on, we're dazzled by what's presented to us. Apocalyptic literature is revealing precisely because it gives us a new perspective to see through this beguiling mispresentation. Apocalyptic literature invites us to lean over and get a new perspective that lets us see through the blinders to the monsters behind the screen. Uh, and I'll, I'll just stop there with that. Uh, let me get back over here. <clears throat> it's, it's not difficult, it's not complicated to help us to see uh, apocalyptic literature pulls the curtains back so that we can see behind the curtains. It's the old picture in the Wizard of Oz when uh, Dorothy finally saw the great wizard, the booming voice and, oh, well, what was he? He's just a little old man. And that's the nature, that's what an empire does. It, it puts on nations and, and as we've been taught by others, nearly all nations historically inevitably become empires in some way or another. And they have a facade of either great, usually but always great military strength, coupled with economic strength, uh, advanced civilization, and all of these appearances. But when you pull back the curtains and look behind the scenes, often what you see is a beast. You see the dark powers that are at work behind the scenes. In Daniel's picture, when he prayed and uh, Gabriel was sent to help him, but he was detained by the dark prince of Persia, of like Iran, that was fighting against him. And so that is the nature of empires, but apocalyptic literature helps us shift our view to where we say, oh, okay. So we need to apply that. I pray that as we've gone through our study, that it's helped us to look at our own country, but other countries of the world in a little different way. So that what needs to happen, one thing for sure, is that our, our full and primary allegiance is always given to the kingdom of God. Then we are, we're good citizens, we're grateful for, the countries uh, in which we live and things for which we have to be thankful, but our, our dominant allegiance is, is always to the kingdom of God, the unseen city, uh, as we hear about in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame of faith, that uh, even Moses looked beyond all of the facade of Egypt and he was willing to cast his lot with the suffering people because he could see with eyes of faith that there was a greater God who deserved his life and his allegiance. And so I pray that's the net effect on our, on our lives. Uh, as we go ahead, uh, before we listen to uh, the chapters 21 and 22, I want to, the text, I want us to uh, move ahead here in the videos. Uh, we've gone through 19 and 20, uh, the final battle, the martyrs. I pray that what we've seen more than once as the dragon and his powers array themselves against God, that they continue to be defeated numerous times, and that's been true throughout history. Uh, Satan has tried to, the promise was that the seed of 
Adam and Eve would crush his head and he would strike his heel. But the reality is that Satan therefore tries throughout history to crush the head of this seed, this Messiah, but he never succeeds. And over and over he is defeated. And so it will be, even though evil seems dominant in our day, this don't be, don't believe that misrepresentation that we see. God is still in control. And that's why he reminds us, like in Psalm 46, 10, stop what you're doing. Be still. Know that I am God. We, we need daily to, to remind ourselves of that. Uh, so we finish the battle, the question about the millennium. Uh, let's don't miss the takeaway, regardless of what perspective someone has about the millennium. Number one, it's not a salvation issue. But Jesus will return as king to deal with evil and vindicate his followers. That will happen, however God uh chooses to do it and then we come up on uh chapters uh 21 and 22 we did just the first few verses of 21 last week we'll go ahead and and repeat that and i hope it behaves make this clear when jesus returns as king he will deal with evil forever and he'll vindicate those who have been faithful to him the book concludes with a final vision of the marriage of heaven and earth. An angel shows John a stunning bride that symbolizes the new creation that has come forever to join God and his covenant people. God announces that he's come to live with humanity forever and that he's making all things new. John's vision here is a kaleidoscope of Old Testament promises. This place is a new heavens and earth, a restored creation that's healed of the pain and evil of human history. It's also a new garden of Eden. Eden, the paradise of eternal life with God. But it's not simply a return back to the garden. It's a step forward into a new Jerusalem, a great city where human cultures and all their diversity work together in peace and harmony before God. And in the most surprising twist of all, there's no temple building in the new creation because the presence of God and the Lamb that were once limited to the temple now permeate every square inch of the new world. And there's a new humanity there fulfilling the calling placed on them all the way back back on page one of the Bible to rule as God's image, to partner together with God in taking this creation into new and uncharted territory. And so ends John's apocalypse and the epic storyline of the whole Bible. John did not write this book as a secret code for you to decipher the timetable of Jesus' return. It's a symbolic vision that brought hope and challenge to the seven first century churches and every generation of Christians since. It reveals history's pattern and God's promise that every human kingdom eventually becomes Babylon and must be resisted in the power of the slain lamb. But there's a promise that Jesus, who loved and died for this world, will not let Babylon go unchecked. He will return one day to remove evil from his good world and make all things new. And that is a promise that should motivate faithfulness in every generation of God's people until the king returns. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. All right. And then to will be off of this some, but uh, uh, when we get past the last battle, here to the last story, the marriage of heaven and earth, uh, his closing statement, I pray that it kind of gets deeply rooted in our, in our hearts. The story, the great, the end of this storyline should be one that its effect on our lives should be that of helping us to live faithful lives here and now, that we don't preoccupy ourselves with uh, trying to figure out the timetable of Jesus's return, but we're inspired and challenged by the story in scripture and as it's culminated here in Revelation, uh, that we have the promise Jesus will return. We look forward to that, but in the meantime, we're not just hanging in there. 
waiting for that to happen. We're not taking a bunker mentality. We always need to remember Jesus's words of Matthew 16, 18, and let that be the posture of the church when he said, on this rock and not, not Peter himself, but on this confession that Peter has made that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, on this solid rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And we get the image wrong in our minds. Sometimes we, we have the image of hell beating up on Jesus's little church and his little church just managing to hang in there uh, stay in the, in the trenches, but that's the wrong image. It's turned around. Gates are a defensive measure. They hold people in. And Jesus said, my church will plunder hell. And that's the clearest image that we need to have of the church of, it's called the church of God. It's called the church of Jesus Christ. His church plunders hell. Hell cannot keep in the captives, whether, whether bondages of sexual sin or drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, uh, hell is not strong enough to prevent Jesus, the resurrected Lord, from plundering hell, not, not by military might, not by bloodshed. If there's any bloodshed, it's our own. It's by laying down our lives to see others set free. And that's the image of the triumphant church of Jesus Christ. And so we're inspired as we come down to the end of it here. We see new heavens, new earth, Jerusalem uh, coming down. And still all of these references from scripture, from Isaiah, Genesis, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, uh, all of these. Remember, 404 verses in uh, revelation and about 500 what is it in 14 allusions to old, to old testament passages of scripture uh more allusions to previous scripture than there are even verses in the book of revelation so let's go through and listen to uh the text here in 21 and uh 22 and i believe let me get there. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jones coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. 
The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide. As it is long, the angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall, the fourth, emerald, the fifth, onyx, the sixth, ruby, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, turquoise, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amethyst. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll, because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who watch their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually false. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Well, always good to be able to just uh, hear scripture read like that and to uh, 
even to be able to sit and hear the whole book, it would be helpful to get a bigger scope, a bigger overall picture to just listen to the, the whole book read through. <clears throat> but these two chapters, the culmination, the marriage of heaven and earth, and as it was going, I was looking for a document that I've, I have, but because of a new computer and different drive letters, I couldn't just pull it up as I normally would. The scriptures on new creation, we've referenced them before, but just for us to know when we get here to 21.1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth to know that there are three other places. Go ahead. Uh, to know that there are three other places where uh, new heaven and new earth are used. Isaiah 65.17. Isaiah 65, 17, Isaiah 66, 22, 2 Peter 3, 13, and then here in Revelation 21, 1, we have those terms, new heavens, new earth. And then, of course, there's allusions elsewhere uh, in Romans 8 that, where Paul talks about creation groaning for redemption. Uh, so we've said on more than one occasion one of, the, one of the lessons that this teaches us, new heavens and new earth, is that God isn't finished, even with this planet Earth. Purified, made new, yes. Uh, but when he continues to talk about new heavens and new earth, the marriage of heaven and earth, uh, that's one of the things that we want to take away from it. And when he talks about the new Jerusalem coming down, one of the things that we want to see we can get uh, derailed by all of the gems and jewels and we don't need to try to really imagine it's all remember symbolic language we can't quite picture uh, the pearls for gates and streets and you know gold as, as clear as glass and these things but what John's readers would not have missed with the there in 21 uh 2116, it's length and width, 12,000 stadia. You probably have a footnote that says about 1,400 miles. Well, it was not, it was somewhat common knowledge at, at that time. That was about the size of the Roman Empire, 1,400 miles square, roughly. And people, John's hearers would have known that, that this, New heavens, new earth, you know, it's going to outdo the Roman Empire. Because not only is it, you know, that wide, it says it's that tall. And again, we don't need to really try to just figure literally 1,400 miles tall, this cube. One of the things that most teachers, a lot of teachers agree that this is saying to us is the height of it represents the union of heaven and earth. It's the bringing together back together of heaven and earth what what got what got separated in the garden here so we, we open with genesis 1 and a garden and a new creation and we close in revelation 21 and 22 with a new creation and not just i shouldn't say getting back to what god did there really supersedes because now we've had the whole scope of salvation history. We've had the incarnation of Jesus, you know, birth, death, burial, resurrection, ascension. The story is greater than it even was in Genesis 1. And now we see all of this brought back together again. Take note in verse 5, 21 5. We noted it last week, but he who seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And one thing that we said, what he doesn't say is, I'm making all new things, you know, new people. I'm getting rid of all of the old and I'm making all new things. No, I'm making everything new. Second Corinthians 3, Paul says that we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another in the image of Christ. Second Corinthians 5, he talks about us being new creation in Christ. So that's the great thing about God is that he makes us and all of our 
you know, incompleteness, all of our imperfections. He continues to make us new, not just when Jesus returns, but he's doing it right now. And let's not miss that because that's part of what infuses us and enthuses us with life on a, on a daily basis. I said we wake up many mornings and we don't necessarily, especially as we get older, we don't feel moved. And it takes a while to get going, maybe some joints ache, and things are stiff. The inner is being renewed. And so that my dad at 89, just as vibrant as ever spiritually, uh, even though he's had trouble with the physical body. And the, the beautiful invitation in verse 21, 6, direct reference back to Isaiah 55, 1, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. And that great invitation to come and drink and eat freely. And Jesus repeats it in John 7. On the last great day of the feast, he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And from within him will flow rivers of living water. And he said this in reference to the spirit who had not been given yet. So today we, we, we get to do that. When we study like this, whenever we fellowship together, whenever our hearts are encouraged, it is living water that is doing that for us. And to me, it just always helps in giving me heart for the word to realize, oh, this is what he meant when he said, Come and drink freely, and I will give you living water. And the, the enjoyment that we find in service to God, of helping others, is it tiresome? Yes. Do we ever get taken advantage of? Yes. Do we ever get hurt or wounded in the process? Yes. But do we throw in the towel because of that? We shouldn't, because every one of those, Jesus, uh, you know, supersedes us in being betrayed and uh, being taken advantage of, but gave himself. So the calm is repeated in verse nine. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb, the church, the bride of Jesus. So that's what, that's the reason that we give attention to purity today. And when Jesus comes, we will take his bride that is washed in his blood, not perfect on our own efforts, but pure by his blood, that we're living under the lordship of Jesus, he will come for that bride. So in the meantime, we give ourselves to being pure. We sanctify ourselves. Jesus said, John 17, Father, I have sanctified myself on their behalf. I have kept myself pure for their sake. Now you sanctify them. So we do that. We keep ourselves pure for the sake of those that we're serving. Our children, our grandchildren, the people in the community at work. Uh, that's the reason that we are diligent uh, ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> look at 21.5. Oh, no day gates ever be shut. 24, sorry, which will bring their splendor into it. Uh, allusions to Isaiah 21. God cares about the Gentile nations. And the nations are always the Gentile nations will walk by its light. No, no temple needed because, as Mackie well says in the video, every square inch of new heavens and new earth is permeated with the presence of God. No more of going to a to seek God. God permeates every square inch. And it's the thing is, it really is that way now. But do we have eyes to see it and perceive it? Uh, yes, there is evil at work and there's death and destruction. But if we have eyes to see, we will see the glory of God because the throne room scene in Isaiah 6 says the earth is full of the glory of God. Not just will be someday, not future tense, but present tense. It is full of the glory of God. 
And so that glory provides light. And then 25, no day will the skates ever be shut. Uh, all of it to say, I, I, and I think a, a lot of good teachers, as they get older and grow in wisdom and knowledge, one thing that they continue to grow in is humility. And repeatedly, I've heard from a number of them that uh, though we would consider them of incredible learning and knowledge of scripture, they just become even more humble because they realize there's so much they don't fully understand and they're humbled by it. And so concerning the way that God will wrap everything up, uh, new heavens, new earth, the gates not being shaped, we should say we have thoughts, we have ideas, we see some indicators in scripture of what will happen, but I don't think any one of us should think, I know exactly how it's all going to be because he just doesn't give us that much insight and one of the things that we see from a verse like that in 25 her gates will not be shut is however god does it he he wants people to be redeemed he is for the redemption of people he has always been for us he has always been for us uh we sometimes think well you know, only through the death of Christ. Before that, God was still for us. And John 3.16 says he was so for us that he gave his son for us. And God wants however he will do it. Yes, there's punishment. Yes, there are those who choose to keep themselves separated from God. But then you have this passage like this uh, that helps us to see that God is so passionate to see people come into his new creation. 26, the honor and glory of the nations we brought to him. 22, uh, 22, 2, uh, well, 22, 1, the river of the water of life. Do, do realize that that's a continuation from Ezekiel 47. Uh, we first get the picture of this river flowing out of the new Jerusalem, and don't, again, don't, don't try to figure it literally, somehow a city over, I mean, a river out of Jerusalem over in Israel, the new Jerusalem is, is the people of God, the, the living water is the Holy Spirit, yes, it did get poured out in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, but it spread from there to Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, and so this river of life has been flowing around the world today, bearing fruit. Uh, but even as you get into new creation, new heavens and new earth, the end of verse two, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So again, however God does it, there's some healing of the nations that takes place now. But at Christ's return, and how, when God wraps things up, it will continue to be a way in which God brings about healing. And then Jesus, as we're going to hit, we're just hitting some high points, Jesus, because I still want to leave time for a couple of the videos that I mentioned last week. Uh, Jesus 22.7, uh, words of Jesus, I'm coming soon. Another one of the Beatitudes, blessed is the one who keeps the words, the prophecy in this book. And he repeats coming soon at the end in uh, verse 20. He repeats it in 12, behold, I'm coming very soon. Uh, 13, the one you know well, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the seventh beatitude, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have right to the tree of life. Well, it'll be in the blood of the Lamb. It's not in our own righteousness. And then you see in 16, Jesus, I have sent my angel. Uh, to give you this testimony for the churches, the churches plural, and the root. So uh, here you have, you know, Jesus referred to as Morning Star in the Latin. If you were reading the Latin version of Vulgate, like in uh, Isaiah 14, uh, the Morning Star, there, the, the Latin word is Lucifer for Morning Star. Uh, of course, we're used to associating that with Satan only. 
that's just the Latin for morning star. Jesus is the morning star. 17, the spirit and the bride say come. Uh, and then the repeat of the invitation to drink. Whoever's thirsty, let him come. Let him take of the free gift of the water of life. 20, Jesus says, yes, I'm coming soon. And the grace of Jesus be with you. Thoughts or reflections? There's a little bit more I want us to, to do, the heaven and earth uh, video. You may have seen it at another time, but I'm, I'm always inspired by it every time I see it. Uh, and then should have uh, time uh, as well uh, for, for one other after that. Let me get. Hey, Kurt. Uh, Hello. Yes. Hey, I had a question yeah. on on uh, twenty one verse nineteen and twenty when it lists all the stones. Is that kind of like a? I don't think that's all the same stones as the ephod, but is that representing the ephod? Twenty one. Nineteen. And nineteen. Through 20, where it goes through the 12 stones. Is that kind of representing the ephod? Yeah. It could be. I haven't read. Uh, I haven't read that per se, but it, you know, there's so much uh, that is so much symbolism here that uh, you know that's a, that's a good question and a good observation. Barb, certainly you see some of those represented there uh, in the ephod and the way they've made it with the stones there on the, the chest. But uh, yeah, good question. Any, any further thought or insight on that? Not, no, good question. Any other uh, observations? So is, yeah, Mary just making the good, and hopefully you heard some of it, but the good observation, as you grow and mature, just get more excited about what he says to us and reading and studying God's word uh, is preparing ourselves for that union with him. And we really should kind of take that, that perspective because it does matter here. We, sometimes we, we don't, we make a disconnect between here and there, but we really are preparing ourselves here for an eternity with them. And it is very true if a, if a person has very little desire, uh, though being a follower of Jesus, but very little desire for fellowship with God and for the things of God, then why do we think that when we cross over, that somehow we're just magically made different. Uh, Paul kind of lays waste to that misperception, even in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, where he talks about uh, those that have labored more according to the flesh. He said, some will be saved, but it's like by the skin of their teeth, as if by fire. And for others, their good work on the foundation of Jesus will endure. So uh, you really are right, Mary, that it really matters here to hunger and thirst for the things of God because it that sets us on a trajectory for eternity. 
there's probably there's going to probably be more continuity. No tears, yes, but more continuity between here and there than we might realize. And before I get into, I, I did have this one, uh, the city of the Lamb. Uh, a little bit, just when we talk about the new heavens, new earth, the big story of the Bible, and this is in your uh, notes here in the online version, but it now is in Dropbox under notes. The big story of the Bible tells doesn't end with people going off with going off to heaven. And that's a common picture that we have, but with heaven coming here, the joining of heaven and earth, the coming of new Jerusalem is celebrated as a great wedding. Just as Jesus began his earthly ministry at the wedding in Cana, now the ascended Christ presides over marriage of heaven and earth. John seems to say it this way, the tragic divorce between heaven and earth is now reconciled by the Lamb. And New Jerusalem is both present and still arriving. It's now and not yet. And we have some degree of it now in the new creation in Christ, but not fully. 20 centuries later, the expansion of New Jerusalem continues. We live in the tension of the now and the not yet. Today, it is the task of every local church to be a kind of suburb of the New Jerusalem here and now. And that's the way that we need to see it. Instead of holding, holding on, hanging in there, uh, we are a suburb of the new Jerusalem. And that is the purpose and mission of the church, to spread uh, this, this good news of the kingdom of God to those around us. And suburbs means we're living right there among them. So there's more of that. Uh, in your notes, let's go ahead and do the one uh, on heaven and earth. So in the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here. There's trees, rivers, mountains. But my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting is that in the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but... This idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwelt together perfectly, no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out and we wanted to create a world apart from him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a, a clear distinction. So you've said that these spaces can overlap, though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. But not so fast, because the temple also creates a problem. So God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty, but human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. 
what do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the, the idea is this. Animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right. So we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. It, literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around, hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. But we, we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple. He's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so, so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is, what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus? Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible's story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. Uh, to me, it's helpful in being able to visualize the union of heaven and earth kind of in some way. Imperfect, yes, but it's a good uh, visualization of what God has done to reunite and how that has already begun, and, and that is for sure. The, the kingdom of God has been inaugurated among us, but it's just not yet in its fullest form as it will be when Jesus comes and presides over the marriage. One is helpful and with uh, about six other minutes, uh, I want to do then the tree of life because we end up with that here let me find it. I had the tree of life. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, do this real quickly. And if it doesn't work, then uh, that is okay. But uh, find uh, do a quick search for looking how oh, I think it's in the way here I had already moved over there
I mean, this is good. We just saw it recently. I'll finish up with this. The story of the Bible begins in a garden where God and humans live together. And the biblical authors want us to see this garden as a type of temple. The top is the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is most intense. And that's where we find the tree of life. So what's this tree all about? Well, it represents God's own life and creative power that is made available to others. In fact, God's first command is that humans eat from all of the trees, including this one. So you're ingesting God's own life. That sounds intense. Yeah, this meal transforms the one who eats it. Or in the words of the story, it leads to eternal life. OK, but on the way to the tree of life, the humans have to pass by another tree called the tree of knowing good and bad. And God says that eating from this tree kill you. How does it do that? Well, it represents taking the authority to do what is good in your own eyes. And when humans do that, it leads to broken relationships, violence, and death. And so here's the thing. Both trees look beautiful, but one of them is a false tree of life. And the humans take from this false tree of life. And they're exiled from the garden for good. Which raises the question, can anyone ever get back to the tree of life? Well, later on in the story, we meet a man named Moses, and he encounters God in a desert tree on top of a mountain. Oh, you mean the burning bush, where Moses is told that he's standing on holy ground? Yeah, it's a plant on a mountain radiating with God's life and power, just like the tree of life. And God tells Moses, bring your people up to this mountain so we can form a partnership. And this partnership will force them to make a choice. Will they follow gods of their own making or receive life from the true God? And in this story, they give their allegiance to an idol. And it's just the first of many. The story goes on to show generation after generation choosing gods of their own making. And these idols were usually placed on tall hills like beautiful trees. But they're false trees of life that lead the people into self-destruction, exile, and death. It's like death's grip on us is too strong to resist. Is there any hope? Well, let's turn now to the story of Jesus. He came to announce that God's eternal life was available once again through him. So Jesus thinks of himself as the tree of life. Yes, this is what he meant when he claimed to be the vine that brings God's life into the world. And Jesus invited people to eat from him. Yeah, he was inviting people to trust him and be transformed by his life. But Jesus also exposed how corrupt humans are, how much they love false trees of life. And so Jesus presented people with a new choice between life or death. And this time, they don't just choose death. They also chose to attack the one who sustains all of life. Yes, Jesus is led up to the top of a hill where he dies upon a tree. The cross is the sad and violent result of humanity's desire to do what is good in our own eyes. The tree of life has been overcome by the power of death. Well, it seemed that way. But Jesus said that he was a seed of God's life that would die in the ground, but then grow into a plant that would bear much fruit. So to defeat death, Jesus went through it. But it will mean passing through death like Jesus, allowing our old way of being human to die. So that a new humanity can grow in its place. Yes, Jesus said, he is the vine tree. You're invited to become a part of it, helping produce its fruit so that his life and love can spread through us to others. And so the story of the Bible ends in a new garden, which is also a kind of temple, with the tree of life at its center, providing healing and life forever to all who choose to eat from it. So, <clears throat> and, and we have that right there in Revelation that as we finish up 22, uh, on each side there in verse 2, on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And so 
here and now. We don't just wait until the full marriage of heaven and earth. Right now, we have access to the tree of life through Jesus himself. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So we, we began to taste of that eternal life here and now. And as we live in the midst of nations that become empires and oppose God in some way, we learn how to live faithfully as followers of Jesus in the midst of these nations and how that we live with the hope knowing that Jesus will return. He's with us now as we go through darkness. He will return and he will be victorious over all evil and then fully bring heaven and earth, this marriage back together. And so that is why we have not just a food night that we enjoy on the last night of class, but at the true, you know, culmination of all things, the marriage feast, uh, there will be more of this and even better, as good as, as, as good as this is. So I pray that you are encouraged as we come right here to the end of our time by our study together, that you've been uh, strengthened as a follower of Jesus and remaining faithful to him, living in the midst of a nation here, uh, but making God's kingdom your ultimate allegiance and inspiring others to live that way, being a blessing to those around you. We'll just finish with a way that it usually finishes a semester, just speaking a blessing from number six, the priestly blessing. So I just say, the Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord be with you. So we will be back in touch. I will send the fall schedule. Certainly by the end of May, we are willing to travel to Malawi early June to see Ben and Ryan and families and grandkids. And I'll have the fall schedule out before then. Send it to you by email, but we'll also post it online. So to all of you there, uh, goodbye. Uh, it's been a blessing to study with you.